Okay. Hello, my name is Matt O'Malley, and I'm going to be talking about malignant otitis externa. I find malignant otitis externa to be a very interesting topic. I think it's something that uh, is encountered by almost all ear practitioners, uh, and it is something that we encounter frequently enough to be bothersome, uh, but infrequently enough for it to be routine in terms of how we manage and treat it. This is a very serious disease, and we know we don't want to miss it because mortality can approach 10 to 20 percent, even in modern series with good treatment. There's a lack of education surrounding this disease, and it leads to some myths. I was taught this as a medical student, that old men with out-of-control diabetes would get a very bad case of otitis externa, and they would die quite quickly unless uh, we got them to surgery quite quickly to save them. Clearly, this isn't true in the modern era, and we'll go through all of that as we go through this talk. There's a lack of data uh, to help guide our our treatment of malignant otitis externa, and this leads to uncertainty in terms of how to diagnose this, how to treat it, and even when to stop treatment. Controversy exists around many aspects of this, and I'll try to point that out as we go through the talk, but realize that my views may not be well shared by others in my profession. What exactly is malignant otitis externa? There's no universal agreement on this, but as a general starting point, it is a chronic infectious osteomyelitis of the temporal bone. Bone demineralization or necrosis occurs in the temporal bone and there's inflammation, infection, or destruction of surrounding structures. Here's an example of an acute osteomyelitis that we're all very familiar with. This is acute mastoiditis. We have destruction of the bone by an infectious process. So this is acute osteomyelitis in the temporal bone. For chronic osteomyelitis in the temporal bone, it will look more like this. Here we see some thickening of the soft tissue, some destruction of the bone. We have the ear canal full of swollen and inflamed tissue. And so this is malignant otitis externa compared to mastoiditis. Skull-based osteomyelitis has been known since the 1800s. However, in 1968, a case series was published by Chandler in which he defined what malignant otitis externa is. In that series, he presented pseudomonas infections that seem to start in the ear canal and then spread to destroy the surrounding tissues and structures. His initial case series gathered 13 cases over roughly a decade. All of them had pseudomonas, but we now recognize that other pathogens can also cause malignant otitis externa. This was done in an era before advanced antibiotics, particularly antibiotics used to treat pseudomonas. He discussed in the papers extensively his surgical treatments, and this kind of led to the belief that surgical treatment was necessary for this disease. He had a high mortality rate, and this has stood as a benchmark to understand that even with treatment, a good number of patients with malignant otitis externa can die of disease. He also discussed extensively non-surgical treatment, but unfortunately the surgical treatments were, were what seemed to catch on more than the non-surgical treatment. These are two pictures from his paper. One shows a very advanced erosion of the outer portions of the ear and the tissue surrounding it from pseudomonas. The other shows a very large surgical defect. This is unlike what most people will see today when it comes to managing and diagnosing malignant otitis externa. Subsequent papers for Chandler focused on medical treatment, and that has become the mainstay of treatment to this day. In terms of the clinical presentation of malignant otitis externa, what we should expect is a patient with recalcitrant otralgia, sometimes with drainage, or granulation in the ear canal. Granulation in the ear canal might look like this. It might be at the bony cartilaginous junction, similar to this piece here. There also might be a polyp that fully obscures the ear canal, making it impossible to see further in there. Lastly, there could be cranial nerve palsies. Additionally, most of the patients will have at least one risk factor. There are, of course, cases with none, but most will have at least one. Complicating factors include the fact that the ear may look entirely normal by the time you see the patient. Pain may be gone entirely. This same patient, when treated with two weeks of Cipro, now looks like this. Another two weeks of Cipro, and we have a normal-looking ear canal with no pain. There's a wide spectrum of disease in malignant otitis externa, and I'll present some examples to show the breadth of this spectrum. Here's a very limited case of malignant otitis externa focal erosion and destruction along the ear canal in just a few spots. Here's a bit more of a moderate case. We have destruction of the mastoid tip here. The ear canal was normal in this case. Now going to a more severe case, we have some thickening of the soft tissue regions. We have erosion of the mastoid. We have an ear canal full of tissue. 
in an MRI, we can sometimes see enhancement in the tissues surrounding the temporal bone as well as the ear disease. Even more severe disease might involve destruction of the bony labyrinth as we see here. Additionally, sometimes when we see this destruction in the inner ear, we find we see dilation of the endolymphatic duct. I've seen this in a few patients and it generally results in very significant hearing loss. Malignant otitis externa can also lead to intracranial complications, and here's an example of that. This patient was being followed for his malignant otitis externa in the right ear. Four days after this scan was taken, he got a very bad headache, and now we see dural enhancement present that was not present before, and now we see he also has an infarct that has developed. Additionally, as the disease progresses, some folks develop extension to the petrous apex. Here's an example where there is extensive ear disease and we have enhancement going all the way to midline involving the petrous apex. This patient has even more extensive disease, ear disease on both sides, presented with effusions in both ears, hearing loss, bilateral facial palsy, and was found to have extensive disease on both sides. This is an example of SPECT CT imaging of this patient showing the extensive disease. And that brings us to a big controversy in the diagnosis and management of malignant otitis externa, and that's the imaging options. Let's go through those a bit now. Most cases get a CT and or an MRI because they're very widely available, and many can be managed with this uh, modalities alone. However, in some instances, people or centers use nuclear imaging or hybrid imaging in order to help diagnose and treat malignant otitis externa. The traditional nuclear imaging tests have included technetium scanning and gallium scanning. This is an example of what that might look like. You have this silhouetted head and bright spots showing right-sided disease here, left-sided disease here. These types of scans are quite problematic, however. They're not available everywhere. The interpretation requires specific expertise. For some patients, it requires 48-hour delayed imaging, which can be quite cumbersome and hard to get. Compared to a CT or an MRI, there is additional cost here. And there are limitations in sensitivity and specificity, specificity that could be so significant that some authors have suggested not using traditional nuclear imaging in the management of malignant otitis externa. Hybrid imaging has been uh, uh, reported more recently to be useful in this disease, and I'll present a case of that here. This is where we fuse nuclear imaging and CT scanning to get better sensitivity and specificity. Here's a 38-year-old individual with no risk factors who has an obscured ear canal with edema, uh, very significant pain, and a relatively unremarkable mastoid scan. On the SPECT CT here, we can see evidence of substantial signal in the mastoid bone suggesting that there is osteomyelitis there. This patient was treated with long-term antibiotics and made a full recovery. Ultimately, while there are some diagnostic criteria that have been presented, none have gained the kind of universal acceptance that we would like to see. And so the final diagnosis is often by practitioner decree. Thus, when comparing studies, it's important to realize that there may be a significant amount of difference in what is being considered malignant otitis externa in one study compared to a second. In terms of treating malignant otitis externa, Systemic antibiotic treatment is by far the most important element, and you would ideally direct this with cultures if possible. In some cases, the cultures will not return a pathogen, and in those cases, PCR can be very useful in culture negative testing. You can do this with a swab or some tissue that is taken from the ear canal. This can also be helpful in establishing the resistance patterns to your pathogens, uh, as well as identification. If the ear canal is abnormal, I will typically use topical antibiotics as well as systemic antibiotics. Topical antibiotics alone would be unlikely to be effective. Here's some imaging to show abnormal versus normal ear canal in a case that might have been treated with topical antibiotics at first. If you're gonna to use topical antibiotics, consider the timing of when you might culture the patient and culture before implementing the topical antibiotics if possible. There are two major questions when it comes to treatment. How long do we treat for, and does surgery have any role in treating these patients? Let's address the first one first. In terms of how long to treat, there are three differing approaches. One is to treat for a specific amount of times. Typically, it's six weeks of systemic antibiotics, then treatment is stopped. 
This treatment regimen showed up in the 70s and has been used by many medical centers and is probably the dominant form of treatment used today to treat malignant otitis externa. Some practitioners have added to this and included a lab testing or, or some conventional imaging at the end of the six weeks to see if additional treatment is necessary because it is recognized that recurrent disease is a problem after six weeks of treatment. So some practitioners will add on a SED rate or a white count or a CRP or some imaging to try to help guide them to determine whether six weeks was sufficient or they should extend it further. Lastly, another paradigm involves treating people for say six weeks, then getting a nuclear medicine scan and seeing if they have resolved their infection. If they have resolved, you can stop treatment. If they haven't, it's extended for an additional period of time. This uh, paradigm showed up in the 80s uh, and has been used at a number of institutions and is quite controversial. This is an example imaging wise of what you might like to see. We have disease here and asymmetry on the initial scan, subsequent scans, no or limited asymmetry, okay to stop treatment in that condition. Let's go over some of the pros and cons of these differing approaches. When we talk about six weeks of treatment, one of the things we know about it is that if we do this, because this has been done to a lot of patients, you can expect that between the 10 and 20% of the patients will experience either recurrent disease or mortality from their disease. So it's a significant number of patients who don't seem to get better uh, fully from this six week treatment. Studies with our nuclear or hybrid imaging also show that a significant percentage of folks will still scan positive at the end of six weeks. And so this lines up with the idea that when we're treating people for six weeks only, we are accepting the fact that a reasonable number of people will not be fully treated with that treatment regimen. If we add onto that some additional testing, it seems that empirically this would be better than six weeks without any testing. At least let's make sure the SED rate or the white count is normal at the end of the treatment. The hard part is we don't really know how much benefit this strategy has, and these strategies tend to be very individually defined practitioner by practitioner rather than employed uh, in a large scale across centers. When we talk about using some non-conventional, meaning not CT or MRI imaging to judge improvement, one of the upsides of this or even or downsides of it, depending on your perspective, is that it will lead to longer treatment times. That's a, pl a plus because it may solve some of these infections better, may cure more people, but it's a downside in that there can be more side effects from the antibiotic treatment. In this paradigm, the minimum treatment will be six weeks, so naturally it leads to longer treatment times. The optimal timing between scans has not been determined. It certainly will cost more compared to MRI or CT. The optimal scanning technique has also not been determined. So there are a lot of answers still out there to be found when it comes to using this kind of paradigm. Some people additionally will never normalize these types of scans, so you do also have to be prepared to stop treatment even in the face of an abnormal scan, even if you employ this treatment strategy. Lastly, proponents of this technique, of which I am one, we suspect that this leads to reduced recurrence rates and possibly reduced mortality, but we really haven't been able to definitively prove that. So this is probably the biggest outstanding hurdle for the use of non-conventional imaging to augment our ability to determine how long to treat people, is we haven't really been able to prove conclusively that it results in improved outcomes. In my practice, when I'm treating folks and I try to assess how long to treat patients, I consider six weeks of systemic treatment as an absolute minimum. Depending on the cultures, this could be oral or it could be IV, depending on our situation. I consider patient-specific factors such as the degree of disease, how severe it is, cranial nerve deficits, how focal is the disease, or diffuse, how diffuse the disease is, I also consider the number of risk factors and the severity of those risk factors. And lastly, the consequences of recurrent or refractory disease. And what I mean by that is, is this. Let's look at these examples. This individual with erosion at his mastoid tip and MRSA, osteomyelitis, wanted to get a deep brain stimulator placed to treat his Parkinson's disease. So I was searching for a higher standard of certainty that I had treated him uh, fully for this osteomyelitis. So I followed him with some imaging and ultimately he does actually seem to improve his CT scan. Now, not all CTs will improve with this disease process, but his did. Additionally, I encountered an individual who would need a cochlear implant after skull-based osteomyelitis. And this uh, we treated 
uh, with extensive IV antibiotics followed with imaging. He was cleared, we placed the implant, and the implant has since remained uh, infection free. Additionally, I've encountered patients who are on transplant waiting lists for kidney transplants, and they would be put on very high doses of immunosuppressants if they received their transplant. Therefore, we wanted a higher certainty of cure when treating these individuals. I consider nine to 12 weeks of treatment to be what I would use for anything but mild disease. So a longer course of treatment uh, is how I would start with treating these folks. If I'm gonna follow them with imaging, I consider scanning at nine to 12 week intervals rather than six week intervals. Some studies I did years ago suggested to me that, that scanning every six weeks uh, was not as beneficial as using a nine to 10 week uh, regimen. Increased duration of antibiotics in these patients will lead to increased risk of antibiotic complications. So you must monitor them closely with both lab studies uh, uh, and uh, clinical visits to ensure that you're not having complications from the antibiotic treatment. Some patients will get a normal physical exam and be asymptomatic, and you have to be cautious about how long you treat them beyond that point. Almost all of them need some treatment beyond that point, but how far you go is where you need to be cautious. I am very cautious. I rarely will treat beyond six weeks if somebody looks normal. Once they look normal and their exam is normal and they're asymptomatic, to treat more than six weeks from that point is something I would be cautious about, regardless of what my testing was saying. In terms of surgical considerations, we primarily, con primarily consider surgery for these reasons. Biopsy to establish diagnosis, this can be used in most cases, though it's not necessary in all cases. Drainage of the surrounding abscess, if present, if the soft tissues have become so infected to develop an abscess, drainage of this is relatively standard and considered a reasonable thing to do. However, the controversy elements come to the idea of can we help patients with refractory disease? And I'll present a case in which I feel that I was able to achieve this. This gentleman who I presented earlier, very extensive disease in the labyrinth, had also previously undergone a transphenoidal surgery for pituitary surgery, had a CSF leak and had a procedure done to stop his CSF leak, so had an abnormal looking sphenoid sinus. He had this disease that was progressive despite six months of IV antibiotic therapy. He began to demineralize even his clivus on the other side of the labyrinth here. We took him to the operating room and we did an extensive temporal bone resection, taking out his labyrinth uh, and preserving his facial nerve, taking out as much of the bone in there that seemed to be diseased as we could reasonably get. And we had one of our sinus colleagues clear out his sinuses. And within three months of this procedure, with some continued treatment, he seemed to have entirely stabilized. Uh, and we stopped the treatment, the IV antibiotics at that point, and he went at least two years of monitoring without any evidence of recurrent disease before failing to follow up after that. So I think we helped this gentleman in this case, uh, but uh, was hard to know if we were doing the right thing or not. So I suggest for refractory disease, sometimes debridement could be helpful. Additionally, the last consideration is facial palsy, and this comes up a lot. Patients have malignant otitis externa, their facial nerve goes out, and the question is how should we treat it? We cannot look at this the same way we look at Bell's palsy. It's a different disease process. Usually the pathology is in the mastoid or the stylomastoid foramen with malignant otitis externa, not the geniculate. So the idea of what we do for Bell's palsy of trying to rapidly decompress the geniculate really shouldn't be applied to malignant otitis externa. And I don't know if I think of this necessarily as decompression, so much as I think of it as disease debridement to try to get them to resolve the infection more quickly uh, with less local destruction so that hopefully they'll recover more facial function. We don't know for sure if this works and a practitioner can kind of go either direction on this, being interested in doing surgery on these cases or not, and that would be supported uh, by the paucity of literature in this. We recently reviewed our own series on this and presented our work at the Academy this year. Preliminarily, our data on a small number of patients seems to suggest that there may be benefit to doing a procedure to try to debride this in the mastoid to try to help facial nerve outcome. Very few people who did not undergo a surgical procedure made uh, any improvement, whereas some of those who underwent a surgical procedure did improve. Uh, by far, not overwhelmingly convincing data, but some preliminary data to suggest this is a reasonable thing to consider 
in appropriate cases. In conclusion, malignant otitis externa is a serious disease. There is opportunity for sooner diagnosis. Morbidity and mortality remain a significant problem for, for this disease. Consider longer courses of treatments to try to reduce recurrent rates and mortality, but you must monitor patients closely. Consider using some imaging to guide your antibiotic duration and adjust uh, this based on your treatment population and your local available resources. Limited surgical treatments may be helpful and can be used in select cases when applicable. I appreciate you listening to my talk. I hope you learned something from it. Thank you very much.